the system of opposition is fundamentally unjust and one that refuses to maximize the potential of everyone. On opening government, we aim to solve that. Three arguments on OG. Number one, why equality as a principle has innate value and why it is that it is a a priori good more important than anything else in this round. Secondly, how we better aggravate for social change. And third of all, why research development and innovation is better off on our side. Before that, two points of the model. Number one, when we say innate intelligence, it means the ability to learn and the capacity to learn and understand the world around you. So what that looks like is being born in and of itself means that you are equal to everybody else. This has nothing to do with the economic and educational opportunities you get quite. I'm gonna prove later on that we'll get more of that on our side. However, it is about the capability to learn being the exact same one for every single human being. Secondly, this is not a motion that starts tomorrow. This is a motion about a world that we wished had already existed. So it is a like, it is a world that we wish a hypothetical one in which it is, in which all individuals have innate intelligence distributed equally. Yeah, uh, clarification? No? Um, okay. no yeah. Yeah. So are you saying you're going to create a hypothetical alternative of 2 billion years? Yeah, pretty much. It's gonna be a fun debate, guys. All right, first argument. Why is it that opposition's world is fundamentally unjust? Three reasons. Number one, because oppositional's world, opposition's world is unchangeable in the innate intelligence that you get. You getting innate intelligence as a consequence of you being born in the very first place does not allow you to change that intelligence later on in the future. You can perhaps learn more, but it is about your capacity to learn more, your capacity to maximize your choices, your capacity to do things and understand the world around you. Secondly, because innate intelligence is an objective but arbitrary advantage. It oftentimes advantages individuals right away from a very starting point. Third of all, though, because it creates a societal advantage for you. You get more opportunities. You get more respect. There are two reasons why this is principally wrong. Number one, because it is fundamentally arbitrary. It is based entirely off of randomness. Secondly, because there is no way in which you have consented to this. You being born in the very first place is what forces you into the position that you are in. Why do we care about this? I want you to think a little bit about the advantages that you might get because of your race, because of your sexual orientation, because of your gender. All of these things we think are principally unjust and we believe that they are principally unjust because they fundamentally pin on arbitrary factors that you were born with that you cannot change and gives them an advantage or disadvantage. Those things are fundamentally unjust and in the same way, innate intelligence, which is based off of arbitrary and random factors is unjust as well. Why is inequality a principle that you should most care about inside of this debate? Because it is not contingent on having better social outcomes. In the world we have lived in in the past, systems of injustice might have been very uh, efficient. They might have been based off the subjugation of one specific group for cheap labor, and it might have been more utile for the rest of the community. However, we still look at those systems and see them as unjust. We see them as wrong because they do not give the equal opportunity to everybody. In the same way, efficiency and social outcomes are not the way in which you should weigh this debate. You should weigh this debate based off of your ability to access the same and innate advantage that everybody else has right away. Equality is a, an a priori good. It is the most important good in this debate. Second argument then, why is it that we can aggravate for social change? Two clear mechs here. Number one, because the world that we live in right now is largely based off of pseudoscience. Literally just random stuff that people put up together in order to show that innate intelligence was a clear defining characteristic between two different groups of people. And the consequence of that has been the institutionalization of injustice. It is a concept that has been believed that certain groups are less intelligent than others. What we provide for is an acknowledgement that everyone in the world understands that everyone is equal in terms of their intelligence and the pseudoscience being rid of. Secondly though, it shows without a doubt 
that inequality comes from extenuating factors rather than the people. So when it is that two people have different academic results, when it is that two people do differently inside of a workplace, they understand that the largest consequence of that is probably not because one person is smarter than the other, but rather because of the funding that they got, rather because of things such as the opportunities that they received. I want you to think of the scope and scale of this argument. This acknowledgement means a radical shift in the way that we look at things such as redistribution, a radical shift in the way that we look at things such as the setup of institutions. Opposition might say, oh, but this creates a void for other extenuating factors to be heard of. Yes, potentially, but the ridding of one does not strengthen the others. The ridding of one, in fact, just gets rid of that one and ensures that individuals are seen as far more equal. The argument is important because it means the aggravating of social change. The ability to say, no, we are not unequal as a group, that we deserve the same opportunities as others. Final argument then on innovation and research. Now I know what opposition is going to say, right? Actually, before that seal. Would you rather live in a world in which you are relatively more shielded from things like poverty and cancer or a world in which you are able to buy a second car or a nicer house? Perfect. So I'm going to talk about why innovation and research is better off on our side. It is a lie to assume that geniuses are the forefront of us being able to get things. A vast majority of inventions come from either A, accidents, or B, comes from small groups of individuals collaborating together to create small moderate changes that as a whole and put together have largely pushed forward our ability to access and create and research and develop. Two reasons why it's better off on our side. Number one, because you have more people that are funded, meaning more perspectives and a more sustainable form of development rather than relying on one individual such as like an Elon Musk to take us out of the issue of climate change. Secondly, because rather than redistributing your resources to the smartest students inside of a class, it is the redistribution of resources to all within that class, maximizing the potential of each and using all of their lived experiences and perspectives to be able to have the most technologically innovative society possible. However, even if you don't buy any of that argument, efficiency is not the metric of this debate, equality is. Proud to stand on opening government. I thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the leader of opposition. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, starting in three, two, one. OG is going to be out of this debate very clearly. The first principle they argue is that equality is something they vouch for. This is untrue because that's a principle that is based on the consequences to vulnerable minorities, i.e. if we prove that vulnerable minorities are worse in our world, that principle is better served by us. But this is also evidence in the fact that we don't have 100% tax at a point in time that prevents the minorities from gaining better income to move themselves out of absolute poverty. That's why we limit the level of progressive tax in order to reach a balance. The second thing within this principle is that they want to fear that they'll change the world from history. I posit that nothing really changes. The privileges that certain groups will get will always happen. And this is for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you look back at history, the way that privileged groups have entrenched privilege is not due to the intelligence they had, but due to certain advantages. Like number one, physical capacity. If you are stronger as a genetic pool, you will have more ability to hunt and get access to resources and hoard them. Number two, often proximity to resources, i.e. if you are closer to trade ports by geographical lottery, you generally are more privileged. Number three, if you have first mover advantage that benefits continents like Europe that colonialized and conquested literally all of the world. Funnily enough, intelligence was the least important thing historically because it required a lot of like times back then were reliant on limited knowledge, intuitions, and religions that deprioritize the role of intelligence because we just didn't have as much knowledge about the world. It's not that we lacked intelligent people in the past. The reason why we have reduced them is because of that now. Ultimately, that means there will still be people with privilege in both worlds. Assuming that is the case, why do we think this entrenches privilege? Before that, I'll take OG. Why do you think individuals even chose to pursue pseudoscience other than to strengthen and justify their own positions within society? 
I honestly don't know what pseudoscience is. That's a fancy English word, but I'm saying that certain groups will have lots of advantages because of other factors. Um, how does intelligence entrench privilege or like equalize intelligence entrench privilege? Intelligence is something that is currently randomized. If you look at research papers, most intelligence within all groups is normally distributed. This is because it's something that's out of your control. It's randomly allocated by God, if you believe in God, or by whatever hypothetical thing that creates humans is. What this means is it is a differentiating factor when economies and societies have to look for individuals. This is for a couple of reasons. Number one, you often cannot redress a lack of intelligence in the future, which is to say you can teach individuals everything else. If you hire a person, you can teach them through training. You can teach them how to be, uh, have a better personality that en enables them to have cultural fits. You can teach them everything, but you can't give them a higher IQ because that's out of your control. Number two, this is also why the world has moved to increasingly utilitarian and metrics where biases based on other factors have been reducing, which is why women have been included into the workplace because you recognize that women can be intelligent. This is why it is less of a reason to step into the bias of privileging white people because you realize that the cost benefit analysis means you likely end up with a dumb white person that co doesn't contribute to your profit mechanism. So that's how you've been able to balance out the cost of the incremental massive loss in profit for the incremental benefit of catering to your own biases. What this means is the status quo is one where intelligence, because it's distributed to all groups, is a reason why society has tilted towards minority groups because they have intelligent people as well. The moment intelligence is no longer a differentiating factor, other criteria become the differentiating factor. This is why this weird thing of one doesn't compensate for the other doesn't make sense. You select people based on criteria. If you take a criteria away, you have to prioritize other criteria. What are these other criteria? Number one, CV, achievements. All of this is benefited by your privilege. If you have money, you go to a better school. If you have money, you get to access better ECAs, go to more worlds and have more debate achievements. Number two, it depends on your personality tests. Ah, what are these personality tests? How well you dress, how eloquently you speak, all of which is better taught for the privileged people who have a fancier accent in speaking English. Number three, it depends on your consistency, hard work in the long run, which is basically euphemism for how many of you have family troubles that stop you from working hard. How many of you have conceptual problems that make sure you have to opt out of the workout process or not pursue your education equally. Everyone with privilege gets far more advantage in all of these criteria. That means these people get more promoted. The conclusion of this and the impact of this is simple. When you look at schools, the segregation that currently happens based on intelligence includes smart black kids and smart white kids. When everyone is equally smart, it will be only based on white kids because the teacher is white and they preference those white kids. If you look at jobs, They'll selectively pick their own communities because they know everyone has the equal capacity. Even if they lack skills, they can train them, but they have the intelligence required. Why is this so crucial? And why is the infiltration of minorities so very important? Number one, political capital is increasingly concentrated at the top. That's why we have income inequality in the world. So even if you have everyone intelligent, it doesn't matter because you need more people at the top to vouch in a world of increasing political capture. Number two, you need role models that have been able to galvanize your pathway for you. If you see less people from your own community, you're less likely to work. Let's say minorities don't get opportunities in the status quo. Even those that don't are more content with their lives. Here's where we add philosophical analysis. Less intelligent people view the world from a less intelligent lens. They don't have higher order moral questions. Like what is my self actualization? How have I experienced life? More importantly, they also don't connect to really fancy intelligent people. Most of us just think that, you know, the nerds that write journal papers are weird and I don't understand them. So you form meaningful connections from your family and simplistic things. What this means is when the world is equally intelligent, I don't think OG can fear they create more opportunities that makes everyone that lacks an opportunity feel far worse in their life. And that is something that we think makes the world worse. So conclusively proven in like, you know, a privilege is entrenched, we fulfill OG burden better. Second, why do we have higher order innovation? Number one, we don't think one plus one equals to two when you separate the one and one works for like, you know, innovation and research. This is for a very simple reason. 
the stuff about collaboration makes no sense. Collaboration means you need more people of less intelligence to work. So you have to train more people with some costs into training rather than spending that money on the research and prototypes. So that takes away money from research because you have to spend that money on making sure all of these people are able to understand what that research means. Secondly, there are limitations to understanding research because if everyone understands the same thing, it leads to group thing. So you often can't lead to further uh, imagining of hypothetical scenarios in the future. Why is this so problematic? We live in a world of global problems, climate change, COVID-19. All of this has lots of political deadlocks. Some people want to overpollute. Some people want to remove lockdowns. The only way to solve that is to have intelligent people to create solutions that cater to all groups, not all groups fighting over what the solution is because they're all intelligent. The second is you also need to trust a group of technocrats and take away that democratic backlash because you know they're better than you. The moment everyone thinks they're good enough, no one trusts anyone and no solution will ever reach political endgame. And that is a world where 7 billion people fight. That is literally anarchy. Thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the deputy prime minister. The previous speech started out with some really good arguments, but somehow ended with saying that people who are less intelligent just don't think about the hard questions like what is life and they just want to have a nice family. And also 7 billion people will fight in total anarchy. I'll do this. I'll take the most charitable possible interpretation of all of the arguments that opening opposition brought and show you why the lack of response to our principle does lose, this, lose them this debate. So first, what was the principle? What was the straw man? Why are they losing? So on the unjust oppression of biology, first their response is that this principle is proved by benefits to minorities. Absolutely not. Notice how Chris explicitly flagged how this was not contingent on societal benefits to minorities. And this analogy is quite clear in that there can be many situations, like for example, in colonization, there might be situations where certain outcomes were significantly less bad for minorities, but were fundamentally unjust and unequal. And therefore, we would not say that that is a moral outcome to happen. But next, they say we don't have 100% tax. And so equality surely isn't a metric you want. Let's go over this argument again. Innate intelligence is unchangeable, objectively gives you an advantage in physical reality and gives you a subjective advantage. But also, even it limits your choices in life, limits your opportunity and creates a fundamentally unequal playing field that you never consented into and there was no merit. The reason this is not equivalent to taxing everyone 100% is because that is about outcome, not about opportunity. The reason we progressively tax is because we hope to equalize opportunity. Our principle is simple. You should not be born in a situation where no matter what you do, you will always be worse than a person next to you who did nothing to automatically be better. That is a fundamentally unfair society to live in, even if it leads to some utile outcomes. On the weighing of this, why is utilitarianism on their side a horrible metric to judge this? Number one, because as Chris told you, there are a lot of outcomes that often lead to society being at large benefited, but people who are the most vulnerable being ignored. And that's the thing that we, we think equality of opportunity should be given to them because we do not want a scenario where say household laborers are forced to work continuously for cheap and their labor exploited at the benefit of society at large, even that that deals with like the weighing on their research argument as a whole. This principle matters for a second reason. If for a second you are unsure of any of the outcomes on either of the side, even if you like it's marginally weighing on both sides, you are on the side that gives equality to people and equality of opportunity to people. Before I go on, I'll take that POI. Um, literally no logical reason has been given in response to why other criteria will make their life worse. Why is the trade-off for equality of opportunity a worthy trade-off? Opportunity is not a value in and of itself. Yeah, that, that, that's coming. Big speech. Okay, cool. Second point, okay, on why social change that weighing up the two arguments that both sides have given. First, I understand that pseudoscience is a, like an EFL, like EPL word, but rebuttal still should have been made. What was the argument over here? 
the idea that there are inherent differences between humans justifies looking at the skull sizes of different races and therefore using that as a reason to not fund their schools. Importantly, this defeats the best argument that opening opposition brings us because they tell us it is normally distributed across population. You know that African Americans could be really smart and therefore you would hire them over a dumb white person. The issue is you also know that it is capable that some of them are innately less smart, which means when you give them unequal funding, even the possibly really innately smart African Americans struggle in school and you write that off as society by saying that possibly this population is less smart. Combine that with the fact that very few people actually are aware of the fact that society is normally distributed across racial groups in terms of intelligence and you actually don't have the reality they want to claim they live in. Because let's be clear, the world we live in is not one where you give opportunities to the smartest women or the smartest minorities in any reasonable scale because you think they are better than dumb white people. It's where you think that that entire population as a whole is less smart because you think it is possible that they are innately less smart. That's what the argument on pseudoscience was. And that's what our argument on proving injustice was as well, which is now, whenever there is an inequality in outcome, you can point to how it was not the fault of your innate lack of intelligence. It was not because you are dumber, but because of a lack of opportunity. Why is this important? Why privileged people are going to try to seize power however they want? The question is which arguments are going to be more persuasive to sway the middle ground when we see those oppressions happening. On our side, we have an extremely persuasive argument because everyone lives in the reality that, that you know, you are... In equivalently intelligent at birth to everyone else. And that means that you have far greater ability for social change on our side. That also deals with the idea that is now replaced by other characteristics because we don't think it is a replacement. See how resumes are still used today to discriminate against people who are possibly really smart but from minority backgrounds. We don't think that the society that they portray is true. We get a, a greater ability to resist against it. Before I go on, the CEO have a POI. Sure. So on either side of the house, does everyone have the ability to be a doctor, to live a high profile, glamorous life? Everyone has access to the opportunity. Not all of them are going to be doing it, but we should move closer and closer to a reality where the only reason why you don't become a doctor is because of choices that you have made, that you have consented into, and something that you could have either done or not done. That's our principle. Like, let, let opposition not strawman us into saying we want objective equality. We want you to be able to access all the opportunities that anyone else around you can. And if you don't, it should be choices you have made, not choices your genes have made for you. That's a principle we stand by. Next on to the third argument on research, right? They give absolutely no response to our idea on how small groups actually really work together other than saying we think one plus one is not equal to two. Except we have seen that when you have large companies in things like tech, they devastate the field by making it harder for everyone else under them to actually do things like innovation and research. Seven billion people are not going to fight on their side, but rather they're significantly more likely to collaborate from different perspectives. Importantly, they will research different topic areas that affect them differently. They can collaborate. And this is something that is really important for research. Also in the worst case, if you think that research and growth is slightly slower on our side, way into protective time, the, it's okay because we would rather a world where the benefits are distributed more equally. We think the society we live in right now, where 90% of the population or like owns only 10% of the wealth, is completely unjust if we grow slightly slower but give the distribution of resources to more people, we're perfectly happy to have that. At the end of the day, this is the only fair setup and system because it gives everyone a relatively more equal access to opportunity and it's better for social change. It's also better for growth, but the principle is what matters. Go with opening up. I thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the deputy leader of opposition. Um, am I audible? Um, three, two, one.
any principle of justice or equality is only valuable to the extent to which it manifests in the best possible way and in the best possible life for individuals. Which is to say, just by saying that, oh, we equalize the field of biology somehow does not give OG an automatic win. If that were true, this motion would be broken to begin with. And I'm, I have faith in the article. Anyways, so first question in this debate is, to a certain extent, if you look at the opening government case, if I answer a few questions, the case automatically uh, falls down. Number one is, does low intelligence really doom you to a worse life to the extent to which you have, you are shackled by life so much that they cannot, you cannot escape it? To the extent to which what they say is, if you are born with a low intelligence, which by the way, isn't a huge percentage of the population, if you look at the normal distribution curve itself, then are you doomed? Not necessarily, right? The first thing I'm going to say is that everyone has watched Forrest Gump. But secondly, is that in a lot of instances, what you see in a lot of cases is people are not essentially born with some skills and intelligence, but they may be talented in other ways. So for example, things like music in a lot of ways in which we cannot explain through biology why someone is talented in things like music, et cetera, et cetera. They may not be the greatest at learning biology, learning math, et cetera, but they are good in hip hop music, for example, that can still make them like make them very big in life, regardless of the way in which it occurs. We think this actually gives us a world where individuals are, are like trained and like pushed towards a way where they can, they can get variety of life's choices. But even if you are indeed doomed to a bad life in general, if we can show to you that average life in general rises drastically under our side to the extent to which even if you're doomed to a bad life on average, it's still better than an equal life under government's world, then we still win this. And this is where the invention bit will come in. Now, the thesis of this argument is quite simple here. What they tell you is that we need more people to be able to think about things so that we can get inventions. Not true, specifically in, which, specifically in a world in which opening government has framed this debate on the basis of world history. Human life and the way in which exists, exists with status quo bias. Even if you look around this room, consisting of some of the smartest people I know, we've probably never thought about like inventing something really, really new because it's just that way beyond our capacity to imagine. If you look at a lot of researchers, you will see that people like Leibniz, Newton, um, Leibniz, Newton, Einstein have always been assumed to have an IQ of over 190. This is important because the median human IQ is 100, right? And here's the problem. When you look at all of these inventions at the past, you need to be able to structure a world in a way when some, where some individuals somehow, even if unfairly, have the ability to think beyond what is in the status quo. People like Maxwell who can invent the electromagnetic theory so that we can right now have Zoom to have a debate in. In those instances, you do not find these kinds of inventions because world history is structured in a way in which that nobody, nobody in their right minds would have thought if, if you take a slope of a curve, you can find dy by dx and therefore invent calculus. Like imagine how unimaginable this is. We couldn't even go to basic calculus in our high school. Someone thought of it out from out of thin air. There's literally no explanation for this. And the only explanation for this is intelligence. And it's not a, it's not a coincidence that everyone starting from Alexander Fleming, Fleming to uh, Newton have been thought to have very, very high IQ. The reason this is so very important is I understand to a certain extent, like OG claim that, okay, if distribution happens equally, then maybe human life in general is better. No, you're, you're forgetting the sorts of episodes that human life went through. We had pandemics on the size of, no, not COVID-19. We had the pandemics on the size of black death. We had people dying. We had child mortality rate as high as 30% at certain points in time in history. We had mothers literally dying with labor pain because there wasn't medical inventions there necessary to, uh, to go against it. Maybe they would have had the same intelligence, but what difference would have made it for them? I understand someone being dumb might make their lives difficult, but at this point in time, they can at least be dumb, watch television in front of them and have friends on and enjoy their life. That would have never happened in a world where televisions didn't come about to begin with. And these freak inventions are a product of calculus plus electromagnetic radiation for so many things that were just freak inventions that cannot be explained by any conceivable human intelligence for their time being. I already used the example of calculus in this particular case, which means that things such as um, vaccines, things such as any other invention that radically changed human life would have never been uh, would have never occurred. At this point in time, we still have no solution to climate change, which shows that even with access to information and so many people having average intelligence and even above average intelligence, we're not being able to figure it out. It's that difficult. 
we need a hand from nature for this. I'll take one from closing. So I'm a psych student and I can tell you IQ scale is completely arbitrary and define the relative differences between people. The fact that you have an IQ of, on 90 doesn't mean you're twice as effective as anyone else or anything like that. The glorification of individual geniuses in exactly this way is what has shot people systematically out of science and made it fail via individualism. Oh, this is sort of similar to the, the whole discrimination based on pseudoscience thing. So I, I guess I, I can, I can, I can um, um, engage with it um, similarly. So I think to a large extent, if, oh, by the way, if, if CG claim is that IQ is over glorified, that I'm really not sure what the benefit on the their side is because surely intelligence has some value and they're, therefore they're arguing that we need to equalize this in some way. If intelligence has no value, why equalize this to begin with? We can just, I, like, I don't know the IQ of Beyonce, it's probably low. Um, with, in a lot of cases, let's talk about um, discrimination based on pseudoscience because the, the premise of this argument is as such that a lot of people assume certain groups to be less intelligent and therefore this is bad. Here's the thing, guys. How did we figure out that intelligence has no relationship with genetics or um, race, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? It's not until the late part of 20th century was this disproven to be a, to be a, a, a false myth, right? In a world in which human beings did not was not born with the idea that we have equal intelligence, they were just born with equal intelligence in general. We would have just made the, made those claims anyways and based it on privilege because privilege would have led to things like inventions, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now that you have no intelligence differential to make sure that someone like a Ramanujan from British, like India, go up to Cambridge University and do things like freaky things within math, we will we would have never figured out the fact that brown people could be smart too. You need one of one or two exceptions to break through those theories because status quo bias is pertinent. The point at which white people would have discovered, oh, we have colonized these many people because of arbitrary advantage. We can just assume ourselves to be intelligent. What incentive do they have to assume that other people are just as intelligent? You need a Marie Curie to make it sure that people believe that women are just as intelligent and otherwise that breakthrough never happens on its own. It's just very simple, guys. Yes, some exceptions are probably bad in a lot of cases in terms of the way in which OG frames distribution. But at the end of the world, we have a more equal society. We have a better society where inventions actually exist. Vote opposition. I thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the member of government. Um, mic check, am I audible? Am I audible? You are. I am, okay, excellent. Okay, just one moment, I'm trying to get my papers in order so I actually read them in some meaningful way. Okay. In three, oh, a timer would probably be useful. <laughs> Too tired. All right. Sorry. Um, in three, two, one. Panel, I think opening government has the right goal of making the world more equal with this motion. However, I think they never mechanized where the equality in the amount of intelligence necessarily results in a more equal world. Two claims under that. One, the moment we do not have differences in equality, we do not compare individuals based on, equal, uh, in, 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 based on intelligence. That means that we, are una we don't have a general way of comparing individuals, which means that we cannot like, put things that are actually a result of circumstances to, some, to, uh, to, uh, to or claim them as a result of something that would be an innate characteristic of the person, meaning that we have to inherently have a more fair world. Secondly, that this, uh, this allows elites to be, to be more entrenched. The fact that the, the intelligence is not equal allows elites to be more entrenched. Thirdly, I want to engage on the, on the science stuff a little bit as well. Firstly, starting on the idea, of why effectively will the world become more equal at the point at which your intelligence is equalized between individuals? Firstly, we claim that you remove the idea that you compare individuals based on intelligence. As a result, you do not have very many other metrics to compare them based on. Recognize 
other individuals compare, individuals compare other individuals based on perceived differences. That means that if I do not see a difference between something between individuals, I'm unlikely to develop a habit of comparing individuals on those grounds. That means a point at which individuals do not have a meaningful difference in intelligence. I also do not develop any of that pseudoscience and historical shit about people of color not being intelligent and so on. That means I'm unlikely to compare them just like I'm unlikely to compare individuals based on the grounds of what language they speak or whatever because it's not perceived as a meaningful difference within my own society because all of them speak the same language and so forth. Look, at the moment when you do not have a general way of comparing, recognizing that intelligence is something that we think affects a wide variety of things that people do and their innate capabilities in many ways, you are forced to look at differences between individuals in a more nuanced fashion because there simply aren't any other such large-scale overreaching characteristics of individuals that would define their life similarly as to how intelligent they are. We think it effectively then means that one, you do not have any of this pseudoscience to justify things and we are the team that actually proves that you do not have the pseudoscience like opening, but secondly, that you are forced to compare things on more equal metrics that are, 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 are taking more the circumstances of individuals into account. If it is like the deputy leader tells you in opposition that you compare that you, or that you think that, that things like, like getting like innovations and so on are a result of somebody's privilege, we say that is good because you understand that it was the circumstances that gave that to them. You're likely to understand that it's not their innate characteristic. Therefore, you're, not, you're likely not to associate negative things with individuals that are doing like, less well. You're more likely to be compassionate towards them. You're more likely to help them. You're more likely to develop an equal society. Secondly, on allies, and why do we think the allies are able to use the various differences in intelligence in, in, in a mechanism to, to entrench? Opening his claim is effectively that allies are intelligent and therefore bad. We say that they're able to use intelligence in their favorite, even if they are in the, in, even if intelligence is equally and randomly distributed like OO claims. We say that if it is that allies will be based effectively on, on ownership of resources and, and, and effectively having some kind of material like OO says, the ownership of those resources can change and what resources are vital in society also change over time. Crucially, that means that only the fact that you can use your intelligence to entrench your position the moment you temporarily got control Control of the vital resources allows you to build a permanent supremacy, which is incredibly problematic. Some mechanisms for why we think that you are that that like intelligent people are able to use, or like rich people are able to use this intelligence in this way. One, because the only individuals are able to actually maximally use their intelligence when they are incredibly smart. Because if you are of average smartness, you can use your potential to the fullest by doing average things. But if you are incredibly smart, you need incredibly good education with incredibly smart tutors and so on to get fully to your maximal potential. That means poor individuals can never utilize their intelligence and get things why it only the rich individuals have access to schooling and resources that are sufficient to use it. Secondly, we say that if you're rich, you're able to also hire the individuals that are the most in intelligent to do the things that you want to get run, meaning that you're able to reinforce your position and lift the, in the intelligent individuals into your social class and partially use them for your advantage, meaning you are able to address it. Thirdly, because the system is based now on intelligence, it's very hard for other individuals to, to effectively take it down because they would have to cha challenge a system that is, is built with smarter rules and smarter conditions that they can understand they're never as productive and so forth. We think when all of this is removed, even if you have temporary control over some resources, the moment those resources deplete, the moment they're no longer relevant due to technological advancement and whatever, we think that all of this fails. Let's all have a POI. Um, so why exactly will all of this magically be put into the minds of society 2,000 years ago that all of us are equal? Like, will God send a message and say that all of you have equal intelligence? So I think that when individuals are first looking around themselves, looking on what grounds they perceive other people, they obviously perceive them on things that seem obvious to them, right? They must learn from somewhere that intelligence is something that you compare individuals based on. The moment I do not see difference in intelligence, understanding here the differences in intelligence are very highly visible because some people just appear slower, like all of us probably know when interacting with non-debater individuals, right? That probably then means that effectively, sorry about that, but that probably effectively means that, that, that you are unlikely to ever get into the habit of doing that comparison because you're never likely uh, to, to perceive those differences in the first place. You're likely to perceive other differences that are now being larger than the intelligence difference. Therefore, you're likely to attribute them. Note also here that we think that intelligent, in the, that the rich individuals are able to use intelligence to like uh, effectively advance their own cause because the moment they're very, very intelligent, they feel that they deserve all of the privileges they have and, and so on because they're more productive in the society and uh, somehow seemingly contribute to the society more, meaning that they have less problems and they feel less morally shit about the fact that they're not 
not giving more to the poor, giving a justification for things like not sharing their resources and so on. They're also not so much controlled by the state checks and balances because they can hire their, rich, their, their smart lawyers and so on to game the system and whatnot, which means that, on, that, that they are uniquely able to escape it and entrench their richness far more. Lastly, let's talk about the, the science stuff because I think all of this is fairly bollocks that we get out of all. Firstly, we're going to, we say that you can still be hyper-specialized and even if intelligence is equally divided, somebody can still have be more intelligent language-wise than mathematically and somebody can be more mathematically than language-wise, meaning that a specialization allowing you to do things still exists. But secondly, we say that the fact that you are now going to need more people simply to do the do same stuff means you are just having more people be put into this field and more funding because scientific like achievements are very important in society and business organizations. That. that means you also have more diversity among the individuals necessarily that end up there, which means you're more likely to have different points of view, are more likely to have more creativity, more like checks on biases and so on, which also means the science functions much faster because it's not a circle rank. Secondly, we say that also means that you attract more varied kind of individuals because currently you have this fetishization of intelligence and IQ that means that individuals that do not fulfill that stereotype never go there. When that perception is very white and male, it also then means that we do not have people of color or people from developing countries so much in the science because they do not see it as a viable career path for them. That means that the solutions we are pro having for global problems effectively are those that come from a privileged position. We never dis discuss how drugs work for women. We never discuss how they work for minorities. We never discuss the issues of the poor. Lastly, even if there's a trade-off and we say that the objective standard of life gets worse, the standard how that you see is, is in comparison to other individuals. Therefore, if the objective standard is lower on other side of the house, we are happy with that because we think that you are not going to mind it when you see everyone else around you on the same standard. Everyone's life is going to be happier regardless of that. Very, very happy to propose. I thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the member of opposition. Thanks, sorry, let me just set that up. Um, and so for POIs, if people wouldn't mind just uh, putting the request in the chat and then I will uh, acknowledge it. Actually, that's a lie. Just say POI and then I'll um, take it. Three things in this speech. First, I'm going to talk about beating CG when it comes to discrimination, also OG in this respect. Second, I'm going to talk about economic development. And finally, I'm going to talk about life and why it becomes so much more miserable under side government. So first of all, what CG tells us is basically we're going to remove discrimination based on intelligence. And as a result, you're going to look for more nuanced heuristics magically. The world is going to be a much better place. The first thing to note here is how at odds this is with history. Please note that given that when OG originally makes this point, they uh, understand this in the context of history that uh, people said, oh, other groups are less intelligent and therefore we can dominate them. The fact that we now know that all groups are actually equally intelligent and yet this discrimination arose in the first place demonstrates to you that it's not the reality about whether or not people are innately intelligent that determines whether or not people construct discrimination based off of it, but rather a desire to justify the exertion of power relationships over other people. What do we think is likely to happen when it comes to discrimination on side government? We think you are more likely to switch to other forms of discrimination that are a lot more pernicious and more harmful. Note that when OO vaguely talks about this, they don't actually justify why some forms of discrimination might be worse than others. But what we're specifically gonna do is outline which forms of discrimination are more likely and why they're specifically worse. What forms of discrimination are more likely? Note, first of all, that humans are naturally discriminatory because of the need to different, uh, differentiate and distinguish among people you can trust in an in-group and people who you can't in an out-group. In addition, you also need to be able to construct mythologies that justify power relationships that are based on things that are cynical and pragmatic and not actually uh, uh, based on some good principled reason. We think race-based discrimination and physical discrimination get a lot more pernicious on-site government. Why is this the case? Because when you remove the gradation on one aspect of society in this form innate intelligence, people are more desperate to prove their superiority in other ways because it's more competitive. 
the reason you switch to things like physical or like race-based discrimination is because these are things that are instantly visible. That is to say, you have to actually have a lot of interactions, repeat interactions with someone to determine whether or not they're intelligent, but you can look at someone and determine their race, determine their physical disability. The problem here is that, um, the problem here is that the accommodations that you need for things like physical dis uh, disabilities or discrimination occur at a social level rather than an individual level. That is to say, instead of something like the individual tutoring you can use to help someone overcome low innate intelligence, you need every building to have a ramp, for example. In other words, these kinds of changes that you need to accommodate these kinds of disability, uh, uh, dis uh, uh, disabilities are a lot harder to adopt and you need much more social buy-in and acceptance of the idea that everyone has different abilities and that dessert isn't based off of ability. The reason you only legitimate those narratives on our side of the house is because you, on side government, you end up removing a very clear access of organizing between disability what? rights groups because of this more pernicious uh, discrimination. Uh, no, not yet. The second thing I wanna talk about in this speech is economic development. Uh, so, what we're going to do is answer the uh, government challenges, OG challenges, and actually explain what it is about concentrations of intelligence that result in innovation. Gov's argument here is innovation doesn't come from geniuses, but from accidents and people working together. A few responses. First, none of these actually disprove the fact that innate intelligence is critical for this. That is, you need intelligence to recognize how you can take advantage of an accident that has occurred. You still need intelligent people in that group, even if you're working in a group. But second note that the distribution of intelligence where there's very few uh, highly intelligent people means that it's at best a very small marginal increase for the typical person. Everyone's not gonna be running around being Bill Gates. But the second thing to note here is that while OO basically argues from example and says, well, ah, X invention happened from a single person, so it's a good thing, we're going to explain on a structural level why concentrations of intelligence generate better innovation in society. It is specifically because there is a finite amount of resources that can be devoted to supporting someone who's an innovator or a creator. That is, things like financial capital, university seats, connections to institutions. Intelligence, therefore, becomes a heuristic for the allocation of these resources to where they can do the most good. That is, by allocating these finite resources to the highest level of intelligence, you're able to get the most societal bang for the buck. You know who's able, uh, in just a moment, who's able to make the best use of it, rather than randomly dispersing it amongst very many people, and therefore leaving a lot of people without resources to actually make a difference, versus a concentrated number of people with the ability to make the difference. The historic example here is that, for example, Microsoft's existence depends uh, on the fact that uh, Bill Gates had uh, access to these uh, 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 relatively closed off institutions. Same with John Salk and the development of the polio vaccine where he needs a funded lab to actually do this. You uniquely don't get this on government and here's why. Because the low hanging fruit where you can accomplish innovations through relatively low levels of intelligence have already been taken. Uh, but I'll take an uh, opening. In Chris's speech, we explained how it is easier to call out injustice because if there is a difference in outcome, the people who from their personal experience know that everyone has the same propensity to learn are more likely to believe that it's because of fundings and things like that. How, why is it that on your side, they don't assume it's because of innate intelligence? Sure, so I mean, I think I explained this earlier when I pointed out that it is not specifically the fact that someone is or is not as intelligent as you that generates discrimination, but rather that because of pre-existing power relationships, people make up excuses, even if they aren't true, even if they can't be disproved, even if they can be disproved by your personal experience. But I also wanna talk about the opening government case. They make this argument that equality is the most important thing uh, and that we should turn to that as a heuristic. Here's the problem. We think life becomes more miserable when you're intelligent. Why is this the case? Because I want you to note that the value of intelligence is in its ability to bring about an actual more enjoyable life for a given person. Intelligence is just an ingredient. You should be caring about the actual outcome for a person's life. Here's the problem. Structural inequalities are gonna exist on both sides that trap people regardless of their ability regardless of their intelligence or their ability. That is to say, even if you're a fairly intelligent person in a rural place in India, you still may never be able to actually make use of this. Why is this so important? Because you're always constantly going to be comparing as a more, important, more intelligent individual to what could be if you were allowed to use your intelligence. The problem is, in the absence of the actual ability to change your position despite what you know you could, uh, you could achieve, you face a much more miserable life. 
you only have a few decades on this planet and we say it is much better to spend those decades happy uh, even if that means that you are less perceptive of the way that you could be changing the world because you uh, uh, because uh, of all the structural barriers that prevent you from actually doing that. I think the superficial equality of intelligence is a bad moral principle because they've never identified where this line ends. On the other hand, when you recognize intelligence as a mere ingredient and in a much more important thing, which is happiness, we think you get much better outcomes. I thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the government whip. Yeah, just a second. Can you hear me? Just to check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mila. Yeah. Hey, thank you. I'll start. is right like the elite for example isn't systematically more smart what yon has uniquely proven to you is a few things one at the point where intelligence is something that you conceptualize of as a difference between individuals and consequently you're also able to weaponize it as a supposed difference between groups that is when they are able to like you know have societal justifications that systematically lead to like putting people down shutting them out of like society and so on secondly that like the, f um, the fact that you are, even if you're not yourself personally smart, which also like note in the position where you are, the fact that that is kind of compounded by you, not only having better resources, but also having an easier ability to understand the world, to advocate for your interest, uh, et cetera, et cetera, like which we think is like more unfair, but furthermore, you're able to utilize the fact that you have those resources to utilize the intelligence of other highly intelligent people. Note that I want you to note that the entirety of Offbench is contingent on smart people using their smartness for good things, something that not a single person on opposition bench has provided analysis for. What, like, you know, given people generally tend to advance their self interest, want the best part of the family, want to get, get like, paid more, etc., as we see. Like, um, that tends to mean that, like, honestly, like, smart people currently are working generally for the interests of rich people who then are, like, defining our people as lesser even when that is in fact not anything that is at all innate. That is a thing that Yon has uniquely proven this, this day. That is a reason we have one. First, I'll start with some extraneous responses to the CEO case and then I'll, I'll move on to within things a bit more. So in, in terms of like uh, closing opposition says that there is like uh, at the point where you don't differentiate on intelligence, you differentiate on other things. For, like, I, I just want you to know that there's a lot of things that we don't differentiate people based on because those things are the same and we don't conceptualize of those as, as differences. Things like, you know, humans tend to conceptualize and think in terms of language. It's not something that we think of as a differentiating factor because that is something that is generally shared between all people of the species, right? The fact that it is not something that doesn't differentiate, kind of given there are so many like factors that we can differentiate people on still, does not necessarily mean that there is some kind of like, it's very unclear what the marginal 
little differences in terms of removing one factor that you can differentiate based on, uh, especially when it's one that is like so like easy lend, lends itself to toxic justifications and toxic attributions. Secondly, like when it comes to like kind of uh, closing opposition noted that, you know, first of all, like there are no group differences and nonetheless, this is something that is weaponized. Yes, this is true. But Yona has uniquely explained this in his sixth century way, the fact that individuals have differences in terms of this is why you're able to see it as something that varies between people in the first place, which is a necessity in order for you to be able to differentiate people based on that. Because if it's something that you like literally do not even see, right? A bit like, you know, like air that you like don't be really think of, like because it's kind of there, like all the same and you never have an experience of not having that or that like being different, right? Like um, as a consequence, like you can't then differentiate groups based on it if you do not conceptualize a bit in the first place. This on top of that, well, ob obviously this has like direct, uh, like uh, material impacts too. But when it comes to then like economic development, etc. Like, firstly, we think, uh, like, generally, like, human experience is not just defined by your absolute standard of living, but also the relative standard of living and kind of your experience of the world and society as fair. We think even if society is marginally slightly better or kind of gets better slightly faster on their side, which we don't think they've proven out of but later, we think of that relatively, you see other people living in opulence and you see yourself living in relatively worse conditions. It's something that, like, you experience as, like, drastically unfair and as a consequence, like, you uh, kind of make your life, like, overall worse. Secondly, know that like yes, we are limited resources, but now those limited resources because you don't need to pay as much to a, like smart individuals who like otherwise will go like you know represent the rich person in quarter or things like this, right? Because they, there's like huge competition like for them economically. That means that you can still like uh, get as much talent like on aggregate because you spend less money on the individual people who are specialized in this because more people are able to compete for those positions on an equal basis. Thirdly, nobody non-responsive to Yona, noting that collaboration and diversity in teams and having a large team that like collaborates well is generally more conducive to good science and, and like responses to this, especially given all the kind of uh, arbitrary uh, attributions of intelligence. This has generally meant that there are certain groups that systematically shut out of like uh, science, which for example means that we have medicine that is drastically like, uh, you know, white focused, like male focused, etc. Something that we think is incredibly toxic and we would have less of on, on our side for a variety of reasons. Also know that kind of Intelligence means that you process uh, information like faster and more efficiently. You do not necessarily uh, like process it in a qualitatively different way in any sense. That means that if, if so long as you have more individuals with the same like lesser capacity working on the same thing, opposition has in no way shown why they couldn't achieve the same things that they talk about. Like uh, furthermore, we think any individual person has arbitrary biases and thinking, like ways of thinking and mistakes based on their life experience. Where the more you have individuals, the more you're able to control for those in a way that is conducive to objective science being better. Like, that means that at best, maybe things can be slightly slower in some instances because you don't have individuals who have that more mental certainty. We think that's relatively fine, especially given our kind of focus is likely to be more fair, like at various levels. Uh, well, okay, so we've proven how intelligence acts as a counterbalance to other kinds of privileges and mitigates that by empowering you. Even in your best case, when all groups are perceived equally in terms of intelligence, don't you think the backlash is higher when you blame them for not using their intelligence to get better achievements, personality tests, or consistency over the long run due to the privilege that exists regardless? So the privilege exists regardless, but you need to know that the privilege is one that is more vulnerable. Because as Yona said, currently you have resources and you have intelligence and you have the ability to recruit based on those resources, intelligence of other people. Like, plus you have like propaganda narrative based on intelligence. You know, those are now not accessible. That means I kind of, because in individuals can still do things like in, individually innovate, et cetera, like as we currently do, do anyways. And people that can now do that on a more equal basis, it's easier to disrupt your hierarchies on either, like uh, in either case. Also, like, like, know that this, this means that, like, basically, in, in the status quo, like, uh, uh, intelligence is abused for, like, uh, like uh, the privilege because it can, ab like, use their ability to capitalize on their individual intelligence to a far greater extent, and then they can attribute, like, the kind of failure of other people as innate, which we think is far worse, because you can kind of always say it's unfair when it's arbitrary, which is much more, like, uh, like uh, difficult to say when these people are seen as uh, not capable of more. Secondly, even if you're not smart yourself, you can abuse other people and, and kind of like hire them. Know that the kind of most smart people are working for like, uh, you know, the maximum pay, etc. which means also that these resources are diverted to not where they make most like uh, use, but also like where they uh, benefit rich people the most. Fairly, the societal propaganda on this being already distributed. Know that kind of like, uh, that, like at the point where like this is just not something that varies between individuals. You simply do not conceptualize it as something that you can like, you know, uh, perceive 
perceived as, as different individuals, and that means that it's far harder to be discriminated on that basis for those reasons proposed. I thank the speaker for that speech and call upon the opposition whip. Great. Um, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Panel, inequality is inevitable on either side of the house. This is a debate about what axes inequality will exist on. We say that inequality based on intelligence is inherently positive given its capacity for technological advancement and greater personal satisfaction, and that the alternative axes that inequality will exist on, racism, physical ableism, et cetera, are so much worse. Two points of collapse, first about social cohesion, then about individual satisfaction. All of my rebuttal is going to be interwoven. So first on social cohesion. The CG case is mostly about equality. We say that you get more and more more like inequality and more pernicious inequality on their side of the house. Yuna actually sort of sees this when he says that we can judge people on other metrics, right? OO says that like more competition means that you get more tension and more racism. We agree, good argument. What, what, what does David say that like takes this a step further, right? David tells you two things that are necessary for you to accept this argument first and understand why it is important second. First, on accepting this argument, why can't we just be better, less prejudiced people? David tells you that society is A, naturally competitive because only a few people can exist at the top, and B, we have an innate desire to differentiate between people in easy, simplistic ways that don't involve like first getting to know them, so that we are going to be naturally discriminatory, and when you're not able to discriminate based off of things like intelligence that, you, that you'll figure out within a few minutes of meeting someone, you're then going to discriminate on things that are otherwise easily able to discriminate against, like the fact that my skin is not white. Second of all, why does this matter? David says that you need a large coalition of individuals to lobby for disability rights, which means that you need lots of people who are on all ends of the spectrum, and more importantly, that you need to have a social narrative that the inequality of ability is okay. No response to this from anyone on Gov. If you only accept people because you view them as as intelligent as you, this fundamentally undermines the narrative that it is legitimate to respect those of different abilities, right? So let's take our like worst scenario and Gov's best case then. People are like no longer shitty to those with Down syndrome on their side of the house because you, you, now everyone has like equal mental ability. But now they are going to be like more shitty to racial minorities, those in wheelchairs, et cetera. This is a much larger group. So even on scale there we win. We also point out that these groups are typically those that need societal level ac accommodations, i.e. a ramp in every building rather than individual accommodations, which are easier to fight for, like getting an individualized education plan. And even if they are only equally as shitty as they were before and you don't buy that analysis, recognize that the disabled people that we have in society are now going to be less numerous and therefore less able to form effective advocacy coalitions for those societal level needs like the ramps like, that David talks to you about. I'm going to take a POI from OG. DJ are, are different races and therefore have different advantages and disadvantages. However, does the existence of one difference justify another that gives him an objective advantage and that I do not consent to? Okay, so I'm not going to comment on like what your different abilities and advantages are, but I think that it's very clear that when you say that the reason why you are going to have a better social narrative and have better social cohesion is because now everyone has the same ability, that social narrative is now based on the fact that equally abled abilities are worth, uh, like people of equally abled abilities are worth the same and people that have lesser abilities are worth less. We think that this is a really harmful narrative that only gets legitimated on your side of the house. On our side of the house, we're able to push back against all of the social narratives that say individuals of lesser abilities, whether it's intelligence, physical disability, et cetera, are just bad narratives. Second thing then, on lessened individual satisfaction. David gives you two mechanisms here. First, that smart people in miserable positions are generally unhappier with their lot in life. And second, that you live in a worse world. So first, on individual satisfaction. DJ makes the fatal mistake of seeding that not everyone will be a doctor, but assumes that all of these choices are free. David very clearly tells you that economic inequality will still exist, that the school district that you live in will still constrain your opportunities, and that Gov never gives us a reason to doubt that, right? All of Gov complaints capacity for opportunity with actual functional opportunity, the mere existence of like a pre-K to prison pipeline in the US where you can predict whether someone will be incarcerated or not based on where they are educated at age four suggests that this is not the case. But the reason why black children go to prison more than white kids isn't because that population is less smart, right? It's because that population has less access to resources. They don't solve that resource inequality on their side of the house. This is also a secondary response, by the way, to DJ's POI to David and Mila's second claim in the whip, right? Now let's see what OO says and why we outweigh them here. OO says less intelligent people have like less sophisticated moral claims and they'll be happier. 
I think that this is a massive assertion. I don't know where I am on like the intelligent spectrum or how sophisticated my ontological claims are in relation to others and to what extent that is a function of intelligence versus like the educational resources I've been given in the political philosophy classes I sit in. There is a lot of conjecture there. David gives you a much lower bar to clear. We still need people to work in miserable jobs that don't require a lot of thought, being receptionists, being fruit pickers, etc. Someone will be much more miserable in those jobs when they have when they, they know that they have the equal capacity to be a doctor, but they were limited by their position at birth and the educational resources they had the access to based on their economic position. Our point outweighs theirs here from OO and also beats all of Gov for three reasons. First, it is more plausible, as I said, lower bar to clear. Second, David ties this to why intelligence matters and we are the only team in the debate to do so. He crucially tells you that the value of intelligence is based on the ability of someone's uh, like ability to increase their enjoyment of life. And third, David impacts this out and says why unhappiness is so ba bad beyond just misery. He says that there are quantifiable political impacts. Individuals in dead-end jobs going to be, are going to be like more miserable on a menial level, but they still lack the capacity to change these inequalities, the financial capital, the organizational abil abilities, etc. That leads to like the politics of resentment. All of the really bad impacts of the culture war that we already have are magnified by like 100 on their side of the house. That means you end up getting less opportunity and more stagnation of unequal structures on side gov and we win even on their opportunity metric i'll take a poi from C cg so intelligence is specifically linked to performance and kind of perceived ability to contribute to society when both both things are perceived as innate rather than things are defined by circumstance that uh, that is the kind of thing that lends itself to justifications for structural exclusion institutionally racism etc in a way okay, so that I'm like sorry, uh, and just seconds. can't happen or uh, yeah so I see what you're saying. I think all of this is already an answered by my analysis about narratives. Okay, so second point here on advancement, this clashes with all of the analysis on OG on geniuses, right? So first, why does our material beat theirs with regards to like why you need geniuses to innovate? Chris just says some inventions are accidents. Do not accept that as a mechanism. Oh, oh, I'm really sorry, but you were kind of assertive as well by just saying like Leibniz has a high IQ. We give you reasons why on balance, many inventions aren't accidents. First, the advances we come by today are increasingly difficult because the easy solutions have already been reached. Second, you need intelligence to recognize the fortune of an accident. And third, intelligence is an important signaling mechanism as to where to give finite resources for research and, de and development. So sure, on both sides, we get post-it notes. Only in our world do we get polio vaccines. Maybe sure, individuals are disadvantaged by having less intelligence, but society is further along. This means that the way in here is that yes, you might not have been the born the most intelligent and you might work in a factory, but you've been vaccinated against polio, you drive a car, and when you get sick, you can be treated by advanced oncologists. We think raising the floor is more important than raising the ceiling for all these reasons. Proud to oppose.